My son Ari got his boater's license when he was 15. He studied and worked really hard on it and was so excited to take the jet ski out by himself for the first time. He got everything ready, did his safety checks, and then took off at a snail's pace, slowly making his way to the open water. He was barely 100 feet from the house when he got pulled over. When I asked him why, he said, because I'm black. Look around, Mom. How many black people do you see on jet skis in Sarasota? He said the officer not only asked to see his boater's license and his ID, but insisted that Ari point out the house that he lived in. The police officer wrote him a warning for going too fast in a no-wake zone. It wasn't a no-wake zone. Ari's been pulled over numerous times on the jet ski, never once receiving an actual ticket. Guess how many times his friends, who are white, who are always with him, have been pulled over? Zero. And just for some background, these are my kids. My oldest three are biologic. Jacob is 25, Emma's 22, Olivia's 19. Ari's 18, and he's from Ethiopia. Noah is 15, and he's from South Korea. And Millie's 14, and she's also from Ethiopia. Lots of people ask us why we chose to adopt. Simple answer, there are so many amazing kids in this world just waiting for a family to love them. And we wanted to be that family. It's heartbreaking that Ari has to do things differently than his white brother because we live in a world where some people make false assumptions based on bias. I didn't talk to my oldest kids, at least not formally, about bias. It wasn't until I had a multicultural family that this became a dinnertime conversation. It's not that I avoided the subject, I just didn't think about it, so we didn't talk about it. But research has shown that the ability to avoid thinking or talking about racial bias is a form of white privilege. I always considered myself anti-racist, but it wasn't until I had black and Asian children and had to have different conversations with each of them that I realized the privilege that I have. As the mother of six kids, black, white, Asian, and Jewish, what I talk about with my children is something that I've become extremely conscious of. We know from research conducted by the American Psychological Association that children between two and five years old start becoming aware of gender, race, ethnicity, and disabilities. So then why do we wait so long to talk to our kids about diversity, to talk to them about bias? Because these are difficult conversations. And sometimes it's hard to find the right words. And sometimes we don't think our kids are ready, but they are. I had no problem talking to my kids about Judaism and the anti-Semitism that I faced growing up. But that's because I experienced it directly and I knew how to talk about it. I also felt that if I didn't know what to say about something, that it was best to keep quiet. But silence is deafening, especially for kids. Silence makes kids believe that there is something wrong. Another study conducted by the American Psychological Association found that children notice race years before adults typically think about talking to them about it. Adults believe that they should start talking to their kids when they're around five years old. But children can notice and internalize bias as early as two years of age. Infants can notice differences in skin color. Some preschoolers have already developed racist beliefs. And by age 12, according to healthychildren.org, many children are set in their beliefs. That's why it's so important for us to be having these conversations with our children early, way earlier than we think. Kids are like sponges. They absorb the things we do and say. Our positive attitudes, our negative biases, they see and hear it all. Any kind of bias can create enormous obstacles for kids' healthy development. 
In order to develop healthy self-esteem, kids must learn how to interact with different kinds of people. I am and forever will be disheartened that my children have been and will be treated differently because of the color of their skin. I've had to have conversations with my son Ari that I never had to have with my oldest son Jacob. Keep your hands on the steering wheel if you're ever pulled over by a police officer. Don't walk around in the neighborhood by yourself at night. Don't put a hoodie up unless we're around. It's horrible. It's heartbreaking. And it's not okay. One morning, my husband picked up Ari after a sleepover at a friend's house. There was an incident, and the boys had gotten into a bit of trouble. But the dad made sure to let us know that Ari wasn't involved. So Ari gets into the car, and my husband's like, what happened? Ari proceeds to explain that his friends decided to go play a fun game of Ding Dong Ditch, running up to neighbors' houses, ringing their doorbells, and then running off. But Ari didn't go. Ari went to bed. He literally went to sleep at his friend's house because, in his words, a black kid doesn't run around a neighborhood in the dark ringing strangers' doorbells. Imagine what could happen if we all took the time and made the effort to talk to our children about diversity and bias. Imagine if our parents had done that with us. And yes, there are parents that do have these conversations with their children at a young age, but I didn't. And not just once a year on Martin Luther King Day or on Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes, it's important to use holidays and news events to talk about race and bias. But it shouldn't take a national holiday or a major news event to encourage us to be having these conversations. They should be natural conversations that we have all of the time, just like the other conversations that we have with our kids. I once had a young girl ask me how I could have black children since I'm white. Before the little girl even finished her question, her mom shushed her and told her not to ask questions like that and then apologized to me. I thanked the mother for her concern and then I looked at the little girl and answered her questions because it's important to ask questions. That's how we learn. Every time a parent tells a kid they shouldn't ask a question, kids start to feel like something is wrong. It must be bad if they shouldn't ask. So, how do we start approaching these difficult topics, these difficult conversations? We start with the word talk. T, teach your kids about diversity. Talk to them about bias. My youngest daughter, Millie, was playing on the playground with some friends when a little girl from her school walked up to her and said that she couldn't play with them because she has black skin. Millie's best friend ran to tell the teacher. Millie didn't want to talk about it. She was in kindergarten and she was devastated. When she got home from school, she didn't want to tell me about it, but she told her older sister. Both of them were crying when they finally told me the whole story. The school reached out to the little girl's parents and had her write an apology letter. That was a start. I have no idea what was said within the walls of that little girl's home, but I can probably guess what wasn't said. A 2019 report by the Sesame Workshop found that only 10% of the parents surveyed spoke about race often with their children. Only 10%. Read your kids' children's books that portray the world as it is, diverse, and then talk about it. Watch TV shows that don't have an all-white cast, and then talk about it. There are so many resources out there that can help parents figure out the best way to start. For me, it's about being open and honest, asking questions and answering questions. And this doesn't just apply to children. When's the last time you had an open conversation with someone about diversity or bias? I know these are hard conversations, but they are so important. A, ask your kids what they think 
and what they know. When we stay silent, they think the topic is taboo. Don't wait for them to ask questions, but when they do, answer them. Don't change the subject. When something happens in the news, use it as a way to speak to your children, your friends, your colleagues. When we don't talk about these things, we make them taboo. A couple of months ago, there was an incident at a hockey game where a player made racist gestures during the game. The player imitated monkey-like movements in the direction of a black hockey player. This was a teaching moment. I talked with my kids about it, and they were outraged. The player said that he was acting in the heat of battle and didn't mean anything racist by it. My kids disagreed and had a long conversation about why it's not okay in any scenario. L, lead by example. When you see something, say something. After we brought Noah home from South Korea, we went to visit my in-laws. They had a friend over, Mira. And when she saw Noah, she said, I was so worried that you were adopting a child from Korea, but now that I see him, I know everything will be just fine. It'll be fine because he doesn't look that Asian. Maybe people won't even notice. My response to her was that we are not colorblind. He's Asian and we're proud that he's Asian. And we will make sure everyone that meets him will know that he's Asian because we are proud to have an Asian son. All she could do was stare at me, no words. Megan Burke, the author of Colorblind Racism, stated that colorblindness denies the lived experience of other people. Although saying you're colorblind might appear to be with good intentions, it isn't a statement of support. It basically erases history. It takes away people's identities. It's a way to avoid difficult conversations. K, keep learning. Keep asking questions. Understand your own biases and see how you can make a change. Uncomfortable conversations are hard and it's okay to make mistakes. One day, I was at the grocery store. I had just brought my daughter Millie home from Ethiopia. We were waiting at the bakery counter when a woman walked up to me and asked me a question. How much did you pay for her? At that moment, I felt like I grew claws. My mind was racing towards all of the horrible things that I wanted to scream at her. I'm sure my face was bright red. But instead of yelling profanities at her, I took a deep breath and put the question back on her. First, I said, you don't pay for children. That's not how adoption works. Why would you ask such a question? Expecting the worst and bracing myself for her answer, she said, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. My daughter has been trying to have children for the past few years and hasn't been able to get pregnant. I want to help her with adoption costs, but I wasn't sure if I could afford it. My claws retracted, and we had a very nice conversation about adoption and how to ask a question like that without offending the person that you're trying to ask. It was a great lesson for me. As soon as she opened her mouth, I expected the worst. I truly felt like she was gonna come at me with some ridiculous bias statement. That was my bias, and I was wrong. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, I think unconscious bias is one of the hardest things to get at. T, teach your kids about diversity and bias. A, ask your kids what they think and what they know. L, lead by example. K, keep learning, keep asking, keep talking. As I move forward on my journey, I understand that I have a lot to learn. I ask questions. I make mistakes daily, but my intention is pure and my heart is true. If we are going to contribute to the process of necessary change, we are going to feel discomfort. 
we need to make sure that we teach our kids that when we walk into a room, we should look at everyone in that room with dignity and respect because no human being deserves less. We need to understand that everyone is different. We need to see color. And we can't assume that the world will be okay because we feel okay about the world. As Elie Wiesel said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. A different world cannot be built by indifferent people. We must not stand idly by waiting for the world to change. I believe that it all starts with how we talk to our children. So start talking. Thank you.